Christianity and Medieval Civilization The objectives are, 1. Summarize the dominant role of the Catholic Church in the lives of people during the High Middle Ages. And second, describe the strong leadership of the popes, which made the Catholic Church a forceful presence in medieval society. Now, first we must begin to talk about papal monarchy. The idea that the papacy itself is a sort of monarchical structure, like we see in other medieval uh, kingdoms throughout uh, Western Europe. So since the 5th century, the popes of the Catholic Church had claimed supremacy over the affairs of the Church. They had claimed that they were the total authority over all, particularly in religious matters, but also included to civil matters, and particularly over the papal states, that is, the territories in central Italy under direct rule of the pope. The pope had dominated those regions since the Roman Empire had been left vacant by uh, various Roman um, emperors long ago. So the papacy was really filled with both an, uh, a civil or temporal sort of power and a religious authority, which was traditionally seen with the papacy itself. But since church lands were so numerous and wealthy, you had bishops and abbots who were often chosen by political families to control them. You had numerous families that were the wealthy aristocratic elites who wanted to, um, for the sake of political power and wealth, um, fill the um, wealthy positions of, um, of authority throughout the Catholic Church um, with their own children. Uh, often enough, wealthy families would want to place one son in politics and one son in religious um, bishoprics. I mean, even at this time, you had five-year-olds becoming bishops, seven-year-olds becoming bishops, which seems like a ridiculous idea um, to us today. But, but uh, the core idea is that these people cared more for their temporal power than their spiritual duty of pointing people to Christ Jesus, which really was the whole crux of the papacy in its ancient conception. Now, there emerged a drive among many to reform the papacy in general. All the corruption that was seen around the papacy, um, really people wanted to see that shift and change to um, the ways that they, they had seen it before in the past. Now, when an individual became a church official in the medieval period, in the Middle Ages, um, that person was given a ring and a staff, the signs of their power. The staff was a symbol of their religious authority, and the ring was a symbol of their temporal or uh, physical power um, in terms of kingship. Now, of course, when we talk about a, a bishop being invested um, with these symbols of power in a particular kingdom, say France, for example, um, the king would, would give these symbols to that bishop. So secular rulers in general chose the bishops or abbots and gave them these powers. Now, of course, this is um, very at the core of it, the political um, and politicization of the religious um, structure. Now, this practice itself was called lay investiture. And um, what, what that means is that lay people, whether uh, kings or lords, invested um, the, the authority, um, religiously and temporally, on that, that bishop or abbot. Now, of course, this was a huge problem, and so it was a huge controversy, and that's usually what this lay investiture movement was called, lay investiture controversy, where people were, were unsure who had the authority over temporal and spiritual. Was um, the Pope really in charge of both, or was he just in charge of the spiritual? Was the King in charge of the uh, just the physical? So lots of, of questions circulated around this issue, and, and lots of them came to a head with Pope Gregory the uh, the Seventh. And his decision to fight this practice of lay investiture. Now, Gregory claimed that he, the Pope, was truly God's vicar on earth. That is, the representative of God on earth. All people had to obey him as if he were God. And that the Pope's authority extended over all the Christian world, including the rulers. It wasn't just uh, the religious order. It wasn't just the bishops and abbots. It was all individuals, all people throughout Western Europe. They had to be obedient to the Pope. 
Now, of course, this would be a controversial idea, particularly if you're a king who fancies himself in charge of a country. Now, Gregory VII really um, found himself in conflict with Henry IV, um, the king of Germany, over these various claims of vicar and authority. Now, to, to get into detail um, on that story, you should read your textbook. But the point is that, that this conflict really uh, uh, dragged on for a long time and really was emblematic of, of the major conflicts that existed in the medieval period um, between uh, the kingly authority, the temporal authority, and, and the Pope, the papacy, and the religious authority that existed there. So it was in, in 1122 at the Concord of Worms, um, really where we see a, a loose kind of peace treaty um, established, where it was decided that you would have um, both the king and a papal representative invest a bishop together, that the, that the king would only invest the ring, which is a symbol of that physical power, and that the representative, the religious authority, the religious leader would invest the staff, um, which was symbolic of the religious authority. And so there became kind of a, a, um, a <clears throat> soft peace um, over this controversy, but it didn't end the kinds of claims um, toward papal supremacy overall. Really, this comes to a head during the papacy of Pope Innocent III in the 13th century. The Catholic Church had reached its height in, in terms of political power under his rule. Now, plenty of popes um, for centuries had claimed um, grandiose um, powers and grandiose claims regarding their authority, um, but it really comes true in a temporal sense with uh, Pope Innocent III. And he argued that he stood in the place of God and, and was, in fact, the sun for humanity, that, that from him warmth and light came. He literally was God to man. He was the vicar of God, and all had to obey him. He considered himself the supreme judge of European affairs. Any, any conflict, any political disagreement that existed within Europe had to be decided by him. At least so he claimed. Now, there are two famous examples of this, um, King John of England and also King uh, Philip of France and his bride, whom he wanted to divorce. Now, of course, those are interesting stories that you should look up, but the point here is that um, Pope Innocent III is able to bend these men to his will, bend these men to his, his decision, his power, which is interesting that he's able to, um, through his his power and the belief, at least, of people in him and his authority um, that, that others had to obey him. And so, really, the tool in his belt for this sort of manipulation of politics was the principle of interdict. That is, interdict was when uh, the Pope, in this case, forbids priests from giving the sacraments of the church to a particular group of people. Here, he forbids um, those in France to receive the sacraments. Now, of course, this is a huge deal. Why? Because the sacraments, if we, we outline them, are fundamental to human life. I and mean, we're talking about marriage. We're talking about baptism. That is what one would do to a child to ensure that they did not go to hell if they died. I mean, young children died in in droves before the age of five. Um, most children, in fact, died before the age of five. And so, um, of course, you want to make sure that your child was baptized and therefore um, really able to uh, go on to the, to the next life into heaven without um, going to hell. Um, that's, in fact, why uh, many began to baptize infants because of such a high infant mortality. Uh, so these these are key concepts that are going on here, but but you, you could imagine even like last rites, I mean, the confession, all of these things are sacraments, and if France or any other country is shut off from these things, if the people are really uh, religious and really believe that this interdict is truly forceful, then of course they're going to put pressure on their ruler, as was the goal in case here. And this is how Pope Innocent III is able to bend these kings to his will, that the people um, rise up in an uproar because they're unable to receive their spiritual, um, spiritual support from the papacy. But during this period, a new religious order in general kind of cropped up. An explosion of religious fervor began to emerge in the 11th and 12th century. Really, it's been described as a wave of religious enthusiasm known as the lay piety movement. That is, lay, regular people, 
piety, right, um, the pious sort of religious activity. And so this massive movement really excited all sorts of people from different walks of life, from the wealthy to the poor, from the elite to um, the, the downtrodden. Uh, and of course, this took many different forms. You had all sorts of new religious orders, but you had also many heretics that began to emerge as well. That is, those who deviate from the Catholic faith. And so we'll see an explosion of the, these practices um, during these centuries. Um, a new activism really emerged among um, for example, the, um, the monks and the religious orders in general, those who pray. Um, now, the Benedictine order has really been the, the traditional order in which monks really practiced their spiritual reflection. However, a new order emerged known as the Cistercian Order, which was founded in 1098 by a group of monks who were really unhappy with the lack of discipline that existed within the Benedictine monasteries. Why? Because, remember, the Benedictine monasteries, the monasteries in general, and the abbots have been flooded with um, really a lot of uh, rich kids who uh, were wearing their fancy furs and, and going out and um, riding their horses and, and really feasting and, and getting drunk, I mean, really partying even, um, because it, it became kind of a political um, symbol rather than a religious devotion. So these people that were quite devout um, split off and formed the Cistercian Order. And of course, if you could imagine, um, what was characteristic of their order was that they would do the absolute opposite of, of their Benedictine brothers. So you had very strict monks who ate simple foods, who owned only a single robe, who rejected uh, decoration. They didn't wear the big bling golden cross around their neck. Um, they rejected wealth. They rejected ornamentation. They rejected all of these things that they had seen around them among those kind of poser um, prince abbot people. All right, and, and they really wanted to be serious about their spiritual reflection. Now, of course, in the Cistercian order, it devoted more time um, to prayer and manual labor in general, but really the Benedictine monks spent hours inside the monastery in personal prayer, and really the Cistercians wanted to take religion to the people, hit the theology on the streets, um, hang out with the people, show them Jesus. That was really the heart behind the Cistercian movement. And, and one of the key kind of figures of this movement was St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And St. Bernard had, had given kind of a famous charge to the Christian church and to those who had kind of just fallen asleep. He says, arise, soldier of Christ, arise, get up off the ground and return to the battle from which you have fled. Fight more boldly against your flight and triumph in glory. Um, the kind of image there is that um, the, really the Christians had fallen asleep, that they had become indolent and focused on their, uh, you know, pleasures and activities. I mean, really the image you might get is that uh, Christians are really just kind of laying down in the battlefield and popped out their picnic baskets and, and laid on the blankets eating their fried chicken. I mean, that's really kind of the image. And he's saying, hey, what are you doing? You know, wake up, get with it. And so that kind of became the movement of the Cistercians. Now, of course, these, these religious reforms are not just within uh, the male orders, but also within the, the women orders as well. So in the high Middle Ages, we had many nuns from the ranks of all sorts of landed aristocracy, usually landed elite wealthy people. But these women largely only were sent to monasteries for a couple reasons, because often the most political use that a father could find for her daughter was through marriage and binding two people together um, and building alliances. But when that could not happen, um, the next best thing was sending um, his daughter to a monastery. Now, of course, as you might guess, often enough, the women that would go to these sorts of places were... Um, women who could not find a husband, whether because of some kind of attraction issue or um, whatever it might be. Um, but also, of course, they, they might send wind, widows to the, um, uh, to the order, to the cloister. Um, but 
there were only a few examples of women um, willingly um, wanting to express their agency in these sorts of settings. Um, really, monasteries were a haven for female intellectuals. I mean, people didn't really want to hear your opinion if you were a woman. I mean, if, if you were um, married, and um, they would say, hey, focus on your task, focus on raising your children, focus on, on um, you know, taking care of the home, taking care of your husband. Uh, but when some intellectual women were able to thrive in the monasteries, they were able to write and express themselves in ways that, that other women couldn't. I mean, there's some very famous examples. For example, Hildegard of Bingen, um, who became an abbess of the religious house for females in Western Germany. She was an intellectual. She was an important composer of Gregorian chant. Uh, she was infamous for um, her intellectual prowess. In fact, we still have many of her books today that are read widely. Um, and so there are, um, just because, you know, you, they might be female, they had agency within their um, religious orders and within their condition um, um, in terms of status of society. Now, <clears throat> the um, other orders that kind of cropped off that were already on kind of the fringe um, were particularly, uh, most famously, the Franciscans. The Franciscans were founded by St. Francis of Assisi. Um, that is, uh, that Francis was a wealthy merchant's son. He came from a wealthy family in Assisi. And um, at some point, he experienced some dramatic spiritual experience where he you know, felt compelled to live and preach in poverty as Jesus Christ had, working joyfully and simply as Christ had. He ha felt no desire or need for all the wealth that he had. And so um, he ended up um, in extreme ways, uh, rejecting all the wealth that his family had and, and living in poverty. Um, now, he's well known for, for several things, um, per particularly, of course, the poverty and ministry that he, that he um, embarked upon, uh, but also he was well known for um, his receiving of the stigmata, which you can see kind of in this painting here. You can see um, Francis of Assisi kind of making eye contact with this uh, angel Jesus um, kind of hovering over him, and you kind of see these laser beams shooting down at his hands, his feet, his side. Now, of course, they're not laser beams. It's supposed to be the transference of Jesus's wounds to Francis of Assisi, a sign of his his holiness. Um, so, um, St. Francis of Assisi uh, is a very famous figure in human history. Um, and, of course, he is uh, kind of cuckoo as well. Um, if you'll see some of his statues, he's always depicted with some kind of animal. He always believed that he could talk uh, to animals. Uh, but those who followed his model took vows of absolute poverty. They weren't rocking the, the fur coats like many of the um, wealthy um, kind of princely bishops and, and rich kids that are populating the monasteries. And, and these Franciscans undertook frequent missionary work. They hit the streets with people. They're, they called for a return to simplicity and poverty like the early church had, like the early martyrs had, like Jesus was. And they reinforced um, this by their own example, and especially living this actively among the people. Now, the other example were was um, the emergence of new heresy hunters. Um, so, the the prime example of this is Dominic de Guzman, a Spanish priest, and he really wanted to defend the church against heresy. And now, heresy is the denial of the basic doctrine uh, and teachings of the Catholic Church. Uh, now, this varied from time to time, whether um, it was official uh, canon law or canon doctrine or just the position of the Pope at the time. Um, it really depended. Um, but what we began to see during this lay piety movement was a spiritual revival um, and fervor that led to all sorts of heretics. Now, there were eccentrics, there were crazy people, but they weren't necessarily heretics. I mean, there, during this movement, there was um, even a huge group of people who followed around this goose whom they filled, uh, they believed was filled with the Holy Spirit, and they, they followed him like they were his, he was his disciples. Um, so, I mean, these people were, were crazy, right? Cuckoo. But, um, nevertheless, they weren't considered heretics. Um, heretics were those who really contradicted the papacy uh, and contradicted Catholic um, 
the Catholic kind of canonical beliefs. And so um, his order um, ended up taking its name after him, so they were called the Dominicans. Um, but, but often they're referred to as Dominicanus, that is the Latin phrase for hounds of the Lord, kind of the, the watchdogs of, of heaven um, that, that kind of examined all those on earth to see if they believed in the truth. Now, connected to, of course, this heresy hunting was the uh, the creation of the Inquisition. Um, now, the Inquisition comes from that, that root word, inquire, that is to ask questions, um, and often referred to as the Holy Office. It became necessary to really discover, question, and deal with, with heresy and heretics in a new way. And so, whenever a heretic was, was accused or believed to exist, um, they would call uh, these people and question them. They would find out what they believe, and then they would invite them to confession. If they would confess, it would lead to penance, and they were able to, through various acts or pilgrimages, um, able to confess their their extremism or their sin or their um, heresy or their beliefs. Now, of course, there was some sort of punishment involved with that, but um, if, in fact, they had relapsed, um, that is, that they had believed but then eventually returned to what they said, um, they would be executed in most cases. And of course, if you could imagine, then if they confessed but refused to recant, that is, refused to repent, then they would be executed, um, usually by burning at the stake, which is what's being depicted here in the the painting. These um, heretics are about to be burned at the stake, and you can see the declaration of the papal authorities. Now, popular religion in the High Middle Ages, as you can see, was kind of extreme, kind of different, um, and took on many different forms. Um, really, It was really during this period that sacraments were seen as a means for receiving God's grace. In fact, the sacraments were uh, the human's connection to God and to God's forgiveness. And so, of course, one needed the sacraments. Now, in Catholic theology at the time then, the clergy could only administer the sacraments. Uh, to, in today's Catholic Church, of course, you can have Eucharistic ministers, people um, helping and, ex and assisting in, in communion. That was not true during this, this age. Only Catholic priests could handle and touch the body of Christ. Uh, and so only clergy could administer the sacraments. And therefore, all were dependent on the clergy for salvation. If you wanted God's grace, if you wanted to receive God's blessing, if you wanted connection to God, then you had to go through the clergy. And so, of course, the clergy were lifted up in a certain sense in this age. Also, too, saints became a major uh, devotional point during this time. And, um, of course, praying to saints for special, um, for special attention because they hold special position in heaven really uh, became quite popular this time. And, and there are saints for everything, obviously. There's saints for beards. There's saints for um, all, all sorts of issues, lost items. And you would just pray to that saint for assistance in that issue. Um, now, of course, the saints' ability to help and protect people made them very popular, and the most popular of all the saints was the Virgin Mary, and was really um, highly regarded in the high Middle Ages, um, really to a degree that she wasn't earlier. I mean, people had always really admired Theotokos, Mother of God, um, but it wasn't until much later that she was really devoted to and, um, and really celebrated like she um, really began to in the high Middle Ages up into the modern age. And so the Virgin Mary, Saint of Saints, um, really took on a new position. Of course, the emphasis on the role of the saints was closely tied to the idea of relics. Now, relics were really anything that was left behind from saints and, and holy people in the past, usually bone or something they had they had touched or been with or been around. And um, through um, this object's connection to that saint, um, the object still kind of contained some of the, the holiness of that person. It was really a link between the earthly world and, and the heavenly realm. And so one, if they went in to, to see these items, could um, in some sort of sense be contaminated or infected or, 
or exposed to the holiness of that thing. Technically, in fact, um, this is an anthropological term. Um, these items were contagious magic. That is, that um, these items contained uh, or were imbued with a spiritual sort of substance that when one was near it or touched it, that it would transfer to you. And so many people believed that at the time that you could go to the relics and that if you um, were near them or touched them or saw them or were devoted to them or prayed near them, that you would receive holiness, that you would receive time off of purgatory. Um, and so this really became kind of the ideal or the um, kind of um, embodied devotion of many holy people. And there are all sorts of examples. Jesus' swaddling clothes, for example, or bits of the five loaves of bread. Um, in fact, even in Istanbul, Istanbul um, they have beard hairs from Moses. Um, and this, of course, gets problematic by the um, high, late Middle Ages uh, to all the way to the Renaissance period, because many people um, even believed that they had the nail, true nails of the cross, or or the the body of the of a certain apostle, or the or pieces of the real cross and, and the wood from the cross. Except that um, in Spain, it was claimed that uh, that eleven. Um, apostles were buried um, in Spain when all over Europe um, all sorts of apostles were, were present, right? And so the relics really got out, out of hand because um, people found out real quick that people were willing to pay coin to get near them and receive holiness. And so many wealthy people would have relics and sell, um, sell their um, visitation rites. Now, for these relics, various shrines were built, um, and they would house these relics in holy sites, cathedrals, um, places where Christians would um, take pilgrimages to. Um, so places like Jerusalem or St. Peter's Basilica or Santiago de Compostela um, in Spain, which was housed uh, the Apostle James. Um, so these were kind of the central places that Christians would migrate to. They would take pilgrimages to. And when they arrived there, that they kind of received these... Um, these holy kind of um, exposures. Now, the objectives were, one, summarize the dominant role of the Catholic Church in the lives of people during the High Middle Ages, and second, describe the strong leadership of the popes, which made the Catholic Church a forceful presence in medieval society.